in an effort to come to terms with its colonial past. The Netherlands has apologized for its role in slavery. The country once had an extensive colonial empire in Southeast Asia, Africa and the Americas. Hundreds of thousands of people were enslaved and sold by Dutch merchants over centuries. Now the Dutch government is planning to invest in education and awareness programs to tackle racism. But the apology was not welcomed by everyone. An apology for slavery that some say is long overdue. Posthumously, to all enslaved people worldwide who suffer from those actions, to their daughters and sons, and to all their descendants, till today. But ever since it became known that this apology would take place, there's been controversy surrounding it. First, there's the timing. Groups in Suriname, for example, a former colony of the Netherlands, say they would have much rather had it on July 1st, 2023 which marks 150 years of the abolition of slavery there. The way it's presented, no, we don't accept the apology. First, we're going to evaluate and discuss it internally, and then give advice to the Surinamese government if they must accept the apologies, where to accept and when. Then there's what happens after the apology. The Dutch government says it will dedicate around 210 million US dollars to raise awareness about the history of slavery here in the Netherlands, and another 28 million to build a slavery museum. Advocacy groups welcome the idea, but they say it is also time to have a conversation about reparations. From my understanding, it does not include direct um, uh, payments to descendants who uh, are, have were families or ancestors were enslaved. I think that's still questions that are being that are being asked and not yet fully answered. After all, the slave trade funded the so-called Golden Age in the Netherlands by exploiting some 600,000 people between the 17th and 19th centuries. Meanwhile, many former colonies of the Netherlands still suffer from widespread poverty. But what would reparations look like? The Caribbean Reparation Commission, a group of 15 countries where many were enslaved, published a 10-point plan to answer that question. It includes an apology, but also funding for public health, history, and literacy. The debate about apologizing for colonialism and paying reparations has also played out in other Western European countries, particularly since the Black Lives Matter movement. In 2021, the German government wanted to apologize to its former colony in Namibia and dedicate a fund for aid development aimed at descendants of a genocide German colonial troops committed against the Namen Herero people. That initiative was rejected by descendants of victims who felt they were excluded from negotiations. Well, uh, DW's Olisa Chukuma is in Nigeria's economic hub, Lagos. He has more on how this apology was received in West Africa, where the slave trade began. The apology from the Dutch Prime Minister for his country's role in slavery has clearly raised eyebrows for many here within West Africa, which was a major hub for Dutch slave traders back in the 17th century. Reactions here, especially on social media, suggest that an apology will not be enough to pacify a painful part of African history that still affects millions of Africans today, generations later, through racial violence and economic inequality because it was their forebears who were shipped out to work on Dutch plantations and, and on colonies solely on the basis of slave labor, a labor that is still benefiting Dutch societies and descendants today. Now, the apology has also reignited the larger debate of responsibility for historical crimes with black slavery being at the heart of that debate. And while some might point to this as perhaps being a first step, others ask a first step to what exactly? Reparations or some form of economic compensation? So for many here, like historians, academics and activists that I've spoken to, they say an apology alone just won't cut it. Now, staying on the topic of Europe's efforts to make amends, Germany's foreign minister, Annalena Baerbock, travelled to Nigeria to return artefacts known as the Benin Bronzes. They're among thousands of valuable relics that were stolen and sold all over Europe in the late 19th century. We'll speak to a descendant of the Benin Kingdom in just a moment, but first we have this report. This is the moment Nigerians have been waiting for. After 125 years, these stolen treasures now returned home. 
a first step to right the wrongs of the colonial past, according to Germany's foreign minister at the handover in the capital Abuja. The return of the Bronxes today is therefore a crucial step towards addressing this chapter in the way that it should be addressed. Openly, frankly, with a willingness to critically assess one's own activities. And crucially, by listening closely to the concerns of those who were the victims of colonial cruelties. It is the readiness to talk and to listen that made today's returns possible. British soldiers looted the bronzes in 1897 from the palace in the Kingdom of Benin, now Nigeria. They were sold to collectors all over Europe. More than a thousand ended up in German museums. Now Germany has become the first former colonial power to hand back some of the artworks. More will follow in the coming years. I think for us, it's, um, today just tells us that restitution is real, that all the promises and the commitments that have been made are, being, are beginning to be fulfilled. And this is where the bronze statues will be exhibited. A new museum is being built in Benin City in southwestern Nigeria. The city's bronze tradition continues to this day. Awain Aigbe is a bronze caster like his father and grandfather before him. He tells us he's only ever known the Benin bronzes from European museum catalogues. And we cannot really get the actual detail. But bringing that our job back to Benin, it will make us to see it very well, clearly what our forefather was producing. We are able to and get it and do it. And yes, and so that is, that is why we are, we are very happy. We want it to come back, and that is our prayer. The new museum won't be finished for a few years, but already the return of the treasures is a milestone in Nigeria's fight to regain its stolen cultural heritage. OTW spoke to Professor Abba Tijani. He is the Director General of Nigeria's National Commission for Museums. And he started writing letters to governments around the world requesting that the Benin bonzes be returned. He told us more about the process. Many countries and museums uh, rejected our request. But uh, persistent negotiations and contact and also uh, making our you know, partners to know that these things are illegally taken away and therefore we are only asking them to do the right thing. Well, joining me now from Lagos is Peju Laiwola. She is a Nigerian artist and art historian. Welcome to DW News Africa. How much of a milestone is this handover? I think it's a wonderful thing. It's um, amazing to see that uh, works are returning to Nigeria. Uh, the works are being brought from different countries of the world. I've had these works for several decades, um, in fact, over a century. So it's really a welcome development. And you are a uh, direct descendant of Benin's traditional rulers. How do you feel about this personally? I'm very excited about it, and uh, this has been uh, a major part of my work since 2003, um, trying to draw attention to this um, contested patrimony, these works that have been looted from the palace of my great-great-grandfather, about Burame, who was exiled to Calabar in 1897. So for me, it's a personal story, as much as a communal story, and uh, it has featured prominently in my work as an artist, uh, my exhibition uh, titled Benin1897.com was the first solo exhibition to look at this story, the Benin British encounter of 1897 in Nigeria. And ever since, I've uh, given lectures in different parts of the world to draw attention to this and to see how we can begin to talk about issues of identity, of copyright, of ownership of Benin objects. And this has been you know, a major contribution. As an artist and an educator, you spent years working on cultural heritage and restitution. Would you say there's a fundamental change underway in how the world views cultural artefacts stolen by colonial powers? 
Yes, I would say that uh, the world has just recognized the importance of returning books that were violently removed during the colonial period. And these items, the Benin bronzes, uh, fall into that category. Uh, when you talk about issues of restitution and repatriation, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a major topic, the Benin bronzes. And the fact that they are returning to Benin, to Nigeria, is a very significant uh, aspect of uh, this discourse that has been on for several decades. But I would like to say that uh, at the forefront of these discussions, at the forefront of this uh, request, uh, it has come mainly from the Edo royal family since 1935, when my uh, grandfather, His Royal Majesty of Akenzwa II, requested for two stools that were in the Berlin Museum. And uh, he got plastic replicas, which he paid for and were returned to him five years afterwards, after. They were returned to him five years after. Um, so the, the debate has moved on, and there's been so many uh, requests for these objects over the years, uh, falling on deaf ears. But I think that, that we're now beginning to think about ways of addressing this ethical question and the move to return these works to the communities where they were produced uh, is a very welcome one. And Germany has agreed to contribute to the construction of a new museum in Benin City. What other concrete steps do you think could be done to help make amends? It is very important that you look at the host community, you look at those who are directly connected. And we cannot say that um, we are doing absolutely the right thing with the kind of uh, plans that are underway. There has to be a strong recognition of the royal family of Benin. This was looted from the palace of the king. The king is a custodian of Benin artifacts. They were taken from the bedchamber and the shrines of the palace. And so they should return to that same space. So any idea, any uh, recognition, in recognition of this uh, event that occurred in the palace 1897, true restitution, will be that these works are brought back and displayed in the context of the palace of Benin, which is still in existence. Peji Layewola, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to speak to DW News Africa. Thank you. And joining me in the studio is Bonaventure Ndikung. He wears a number of hats, but in summary, is a renowned art critic, curator, and the artistic director of the 13th Bamako Encounters, which we'll talk about in a moment. Welcome to DW News Africa. It's great to have you. Now, I want to first ask you about what we discussed earlier in the show. We heard about the Netherlands apology and Germany returning stolen art. Is Europe on the right track to make amends for its past? I think it's long overdue. I think uh, these are things that should have been done a long time ago. But we're very happy that they're being done now. You know, if we look at the question of restitution, I think um, it's very commendable. One has to take the opportunity to, to thank a lot of grassroots organizations in, in Berlin, in Germany, in France, and all over the world that have been working towards this for, for decades now. Uh, like uh, Berlin Postcolonial, or Savvy Contemporary, or EOTO, but also, you know, say a word of thanks to the Minister of Culture, uh, Claudia Roth, and, and the Ministerial Director, Andreas Gergen, and many others that have been, that have invested a lot in doing this. So it's, a, it's the right track. As for the apology, I think uh, it's also a beautiful gesture, uh, an important gesture, but it should be, you know, followed up by action. Okay. Well, now switching gears, uh, let's look at uh, the Bamako encounters in Mali, which you've just returned from. It's back after a three-year hiatus, and it's one of the most important cultural events in Africa, bringing together photographers from across the continent and the diaspora to display their work. Let's have a look. Women, strong and proud in traditional dress, stare directly into the lens of Ishola Akpo. The artist from Benin used 17th and 18th century paintings found in European museums to inspire his photographs, reimagining African queens long forgotten by history. I was exploring the history of my grandmother, the history linked to her. Hakim Benchkroon's images examine transitional landscapes found in his Moroccan homeland. They celebrate the legacy of architecture that's fallen into ruin. 
The works are just a few of hundreds on display in the Malian capital. Since launching almost three decades ago, the Bamako Encounters has become the most important event dedicated to contemporary photography on the African continent. The first post-pandemic show is bigger than ever. Over 75 artists are showcasing their work across eight venues. Among them, Italian Senegalese artist Binta Dio. Her work explores migration and identity and often uses hair as a recurring symbol. Encounters is also celebrating several renowned artists with retrospectives. One is Moroccan photographer and filmmaker Daoud Aoulad Sayad. Another, Cuban-born artist Maria Magdalena Campos Pons. At the launch event at Bamako's National Museum, artistic director Bonaventure Sorbe Jeng Ndikong brought together contributing artists and local students, who clearly enjoyed the opportunity to get up close and personal with the art. They're obviously in a market, and you can see the difference between people of different religions. Islam, Christianity and animists. You can also see how they're all helping each other. This is the work that spoke to me the most. When you see it, I don't know what you see, but I notice lots of things. For example, the little black line that goes down here. It really caught my attention. I like it a lot. At the Bamako Encounters, the artworks are just the beginning. Visitors can also enjoy workshops, debates and performances. Fans of contemporary photography have until February 8th to visit. So we just saw you feature in that piece as well. This is the, the first show since the start of the pandemic. How significant is it that this took place in Mali? Well, it's quite important, quite significant, I have to say, not only for Mali, but for the whole African world, because we had artists from uh, Afro-Brazilian artists, artists from, from the U.S., uh, from South Africa, from all over the African world. And uh, the, this Bahia that was put up in 1994 serves as a moment of encounter, as the name says, you know, so all these people happen to meet each other there and to exchange. So it's quite important for the artists, but also important for the country itself, because also economically, but also it reminds us about the role of culture within our societies, which I think is a fundamental thing to, to do and keep on doing. So it's quite important. Now, much of the works have embraced the concept of identity. Mm. Talk us through that. Well, I, I won't say it just embraces identity because the, the, the title of the, the, the exhibition is Maka Mayaka Chayere Kono, which in Bambara means uh, les personnes de ma personne sont multiples dans ma personne. The persons of my person are multiple in my person. So it's about multiplicity within the individual. So it's not a simple or simplified understanding of what identity means, but embraces the multiplicity of identities even within one being, let alone the society, right? So we're thinking about multiplicity and differences, right, in terms of uh, our heritage, in terms of landscape, in terms of the societies, in terms of nationhood, you know, because we tend to think that these uh, states represent one identity, one kind of people, but it's this vast you know, difference that actually actually makes up society. And we wanted to talk about that. We wanted to, we chose poetry rather than the simple, superficial, um, you know, identity discourse. So it sounds very much like while this was an event for a lot of African photographers, mm -hmm. it also put many photographers on the international yes. map, yes. to say. exactly. Because our understanding of Africa goes beyond the continent mm. itself, right? So, But we also wanted to show solidarity with artists from different parts of the world. That's why we invited uh, a collective of Dalit artists from India to present their works there. And, and to also underline these um, histories of resistances. You know, at the moment, 
point where you had the, the Black Panthers acting from the US, you also had the Dalit Panthers acting from India. So we wanted to make these relations, you know, but also center people like Ambedkar, you know, and their practices and their practice of resistance, you know, over decades, over generations, you know. So uh, it was also complicating the notion of what Africa could possibly be. And where to next? For who? For me? The future of this Biennale. Oh, well, I hope it continues. It, it's, it's not been an easy thing to realise because sometimes we tend to put culture at the very back end and prioritise everything else without understanding that without culture, there is no foundation. So I hope it continues there. And looking forward to the next edition, which will definitely not be me doing it. Bonnie Venture and Dick Hong, thank you very much indeed for speaking to DW News My Africa. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me.